All right. So welcome everyone. We will get started here. So my name is Z Jeremic, and I'm today's host and CEO of Mass Engines. Uh, Mass Engines enables enterprise brands to engage modern buyers through content-driven revenue-focused demand generation initiatives. Or in other words, we create leads that convert their revenue. Awesome. So I see most of you are, are actively joining here. So thank you for joining us. This is our first quarterly live forum on firing up your lead quality. Before we get started, let me introduce the M Squared Marketing Masterminds concept. This is really meant to be a collaborative and interactive virtual forum to directly address issues and questions facing marketers today. We are looking to host frank, straight to the point dialogue between forward thinking marketers. Each forum will tackle a hot button topic, topic and will use a LinkedIn group to facilitate the conversations before and after the event. When most of us think of online conversations, we think of webinars and death by PowerPoint. This forum is not supposed to be a passive watch experience. Engagement and collaboration are core values. We want you to engage and help us shape these conversations. Throughout the session today, there will be opportunities for you to answer poll questions, contribute to the conversation through a chat function, and come on mic to ask questions. We want this to be an interactive and thought-provoking session. All right, so how do these forums work? First, the conversation begins before we meet. So before the forum, our guest speakers have, will share their perspectives on the topic at hand. And then the audience is invited to join the conversation by submitting their experiences, feedback, questions, and proposed solutions to the topic on the discussion hub. Um, really, and this was set up to make sure that we're, everyone's prepped up and ready for the live forum. And when we meet in person, like today, I will host the experts and will address the most relevant perspectives shared in the discussion hub, as well as answer audience questions and perspectives in a live, unscripted, and interactive discussion. The goal here is to build a shared understanding of the problem and identify real tools to help manage it. Uh, the conversation continues afterwards in the Marketing Masterminds LinkedIn group, where we can all continue to engage and share tools, resources, success stories, and learnings. For our first forum, we're tackling a challenge most of us directly or indirectly are affected by, lack of alignment between marketing and sales and its impact on lead quality. All right, so with that in mind, let's hear from you. So this will be a first uh, interactive poll. Please take a moment to answer the, the, the poll question. How would you rate sales and marketing alignment in your organization? So if it's poor, you guys are not talking, um, put a one. If it's excellent, there's a weekly or a bi-weekly meeting and full alignment, put a five in. I'm, I'm going to right, go here. I'm going to put in my answer here as well. Um, so cool. So I'm hoping everyone's having a chance to, um, to, to answer the poll. And let's kind of, uh, let's see what the results are. All right. So um, let's see. So the results are coming in. It's looking pretty pretty decent. So there's no ones and no fives, but overall, we're, we, it looks like we're right there in the middle. So folks are recognizing there's room for improvement, but it's, it's not that bad. There is, the conversations are happening. This is excellent. So we're seeing actually a number of, of threes and fours. All right. So great starting point. Um, so let's go over our agenda um, to, to ground the conversation, really. So we'll start here. Uh, by giving Darcy and Darren a few minutes to summarize their thoughts on the state of relationship between marketing and sales. Um, then we'll turn it over to you all. So we'll tackle some of the questions from the, from the discussion that's been happening on a free forum page. And we'll use the, the chat to actually get the, uh, your, your questions and perspectives. And we'll, again, we'll look to engage everyone in this conversation. Um, if you've got a contribution, again, please put it in the chat. Uh, and Leah, our chat box moderator, will work uh, to bring them forward. And if you're comfortable, we'll ask you to come on mic to ask your questions. Now, on to our guest speakers. 
So first, I'd like to introduce Darcy Vanish, who is re representing the marketing perspective for our forum today. As head of Revenue Marketing Americas at Poly, Darcy is responsible for developing a scalable revenue growth strategy through customer and channel marketing across verticals in the US, Canada, and Latin markets. She's passionate about driving profitable business outcomes, altering the perception of marketing as a cost center to a value-added revenue driver, and committed to leading with integrity and accountability. Now, in the other corner, bring the sales perspective, we have Darren Robbie. Darren has over 25 years of sales experience developing, developed through starting and selling numerous businesses. His first business was running an outsourced lead generation firm for B2B clients before he founded Focus Sales Management, which offered a part-time sales manager for small and mid-sized B2B companies, and then Focus CRM to provide ongoing support and training for companies struggling with Salesforce. Today, Darren uses all of his experience to provide clients with sales-related consulting, coaching, training, and speaking. Welcome, Darren and Darcy. Good to be here. Great to be here. Nice to see you all. Excellent. Now, before we dive into the, into the discussion, just quickly, let's just cover a few housekeeping items. I know, you know, we're all kind of familiar with Zoom calls and online conferences, but again, we're trying to foster collaboration, so we're trying to run this a little bit differently. So all participants will be muted unless called upon. Occasionally, polls will pop up. As you've seen, please participate if you feel so inclined. If you've got a comment or a question, type it into the chat. If you have any technical difficulties, please direct message Emily Paola. Um, and all slides and resources discussed today will be shared via the LinkedIn group as well as in a follow-up email. All right, so let's jump right in, kick this off by hearing from Darcy on her perspective on the state of the relation between sales and marketing. All right, so we, again, we were really wanted to make sure both sides are represented. So we're actually on two perspectives. Uh, Darcy, over to you. Great, thanks, Z. Um, my perception of the relationship between sales and marketing is that they're really one and the same, right? We're ultimately all trying to achieve the same goal, which is to increase revenue. Um, I think there are complementary but unique roles that each side of the organization plays. Marketing is really building a compelling story that solves customer challenges, creating brand value and brand recognition at scale, um, promoting relevant offers and defining the right marketing mix to complement the sales strategy. And they're identifying the relevant buyers and personas in order to create engaging customer experiences throughout the customer life cycle. They're also identifying prospects and nurturing them through that journey until they're either requesting sales engagement or they reach a, a previously defined and agreed upon threshold of interest that indicates an intent to purchase. Um, sales, on the other hand, there's multiple roles that they play. So that would kind of define their core focus. You have hunters and farmers and your inside sales support account managers, that type of thing. Um, but they're really developing and managing personal relationships within their accounts. They're leveraging marketing research and assets and the customer engagements that marketing uh, or the customers are having with marketing activity to really bring the brand solutions to life by, you know, identifying the right mix of products and services to meet the customer's unique needs. Um, they work with product and technical teams to develop proof of concept and demos and really that one-to-one -one kind of hand hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, they support the customer throughout the decision-making process, making sure that they're talking with the key decision-makers, and hopefully they're identifying use cases to validate that solution story, which can then in turn feed the marketing engine. Um, lastly, I'd say there, there are six fundamental requirements to creating alignment, and I think it's really important to have the key stakeholders involved at the onset. You have a better chance for buy-in. You also have a reduced likelihood that the stakeholders are going to question the logic or the integrity of the results. Um, one, clear understanding of strategy, which is critical, uh, an agreement on the role sales and marketing will play in revenue attainment across the routes to market, uh, the goals, KPIs, and the framework to be used in measuring performance, a documented lead funnel process and qualification criteria, the SLAs, you know, the rules and the, the timelines and um, dependencies, and then finally, a holistic go-to-market plan based on the, the strategy and the goals being set. Um, now for the next question, how do you sort engage leads from the qualified ones? I think it's important, obviously, first you're routing leads appropriate to the sales teams, the channel partners, as defined in this dissemination plan of your lead flow process and your SLAs. Um, you're prioritizing the hand raiser, so making sure somebody who has indicated interest in speaking to sales is talking to them immediately or as close to immediately as possible, and then ultimately scoring and ranking your leads 
based on the business objectives. So it could be a target market, an audience, a specific customer, um, a core product or service that you're you know, prioritizing, or even a priority campaign or initiative that, that marketing is running. So that's kind of my, in a, in a nutshell. Fantastic, thanks for that, Darcy. All right, before we hear from Darren, let's do another quick live poll to gauge where we are as a group. To your best understanding, what percentage of marketing qualified leads does your sales team follow up on? So would you say they follow up on more than 75%? So, you know, basically most of the leads your, your marketing organization generates, sales is following up on and converting or, or disqualifying. Roughly 50% or would you say, yeah, probably less than 50%. So let's... Uh, Let's uh, wait for everyone's responses here. And I will say while we wait, in my experience, these numbers really do vary across organizations based on setup. If inside sales is responsible for following up on leads, marketing generates then similar to telequalification, then the numbers will be higher. Uh, if inside sales or field sales gets leads and they're accountable for quota, then the number of leads tends to be lower because they're feeling the pressure and they're gonna be more critical of some of the leads they get from marketing. All right, so thanks everyone for participating. Let's see what we've got. All right, so um, it looks like, okay, it looks pretty good. So we have a um, majority of the participants actually say that more than 75% of their MQLs are followed up on, so 53%. Uh, and then we have a split of 24 and 24% or either roughly above 50 or less than 50. So, okay, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. This is actually better than I expected. So most of the participants here actually in their organization sales does readily follow up. But again, there is a number of participants who are finding uh, either you know, 50 or less than 50. So, okay, this is good, this is excellent. So let's, um, now, um, I think this is great. I, I think again, like to, to get the, the, the feedback, I will also say before we hear from Darren, a quick reminder, please feel free to use the chat function, uh, add your thoughts, your comments, the Darcy's comments spark some ideas on your side. Uh, use the chat, let us know. Um, again, we're gonna look to use uh, the comments and the uh, questions in the, in the live Q&A, which is gonna come right after. Now, Darren, over to hey, you, what's your uh, take? Yes. Z, before we get uh, Darren to give his take, just wanted to call that Martin had asked a question about, are we assuming BDR or SDR team is part of the sales team? So just maybe Darren, you can think about that when you're talking. Actually, you set me up without even, without even planning. That was like a world-class segue. So, so, so first of all, good morning, everybody. Great to see you all. Um, well, great, great to see four of you and the rest I get to see your black screens. Um, but um, I, I do want to comment before I get into sharing what I was originally intending to share. Um, I want to kind of uh, say two uh, comments regarding the poll question. One is, one is uh, to Martin's question, great question. So I'm a huge believer. If you're a company that generates a ton of leads, they have a very active marketing department, you know, you're spending, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, it could be a million dollars a year, you know, constantly generating leads. I strongly believe in having that inside sales, business development, BDR, SDR role as the intermediary between marketing and sales. Um, and that way they follow up the leads. They categorize them like Darcy was saying. They give the, the, the ones that are ready to the sales team and they continue to nurture the ones in the, in the, in the middle. Okay. So, so, that, so that's my first comment. So, um, so if you're generating a thousand leads a year, if you're generating 500 leads a year, that, those kinds of numbers are more, having one dedicated business development person often hired to be a salesperson in training, kind of like a farm team in a baseball league, or if you're Canadian in the, you know, in the NHL, and then that, and then that job, they learn half of the job by following up all these leads and they actually then can graduate to becoming a salesperson. So that's my first comment. My second comment is if I could restructure the question that was in the poll, I would say how many, what percentage of leads are successfully followed up? Because the word successful means actually having a two-way conversation with the lead. 
If you say to a salesperson, did you follow up a lead? If they sent an email saying, hi, Bob, um, thank you for seeing me at the trade show. Here's a link. If you want any information, let me know. Send regards, never talk to them again. That's not a successful lead follow-up. That is a lead follow-up just badly. So the word, so that, so the key word there is how often does, how often does marketing, uh, how often does sales have a two-way conversation with the lead after it's generated? And that percentage, I'm sure, is not greater than 75 because of a whole bunch of reasons. Now, back to my question at hand. What's my take on the relationship between sales and marketing? Well, if you see on my beard lots of white hair, it's because I've been around a long time. And so I started doing this in, in the mid-90s. And in the mid-90s, sales and marketing were on two completely different planets. Um, you know, one was considered this this very measurable, very structured, very performance-based team. And the other one was considered the soft, fluffy people in the corner making pretty pictures. So the good news is that's changed. And there's, and there's been, um, um, there's been, you know, always, there's been kind of two major things that have changed that. The first one is, is, is kind of in my second bullet, which is CRM, which I trust everybody knows what that is today, whether it's Salesforce or Pipedrive or Goldmine or, 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 or Zoho or Sugar or Microsoft, doesn't matter. If it's used properly, then everybody gets to see the same results. So instead of marketing just lobbing leads over to sales and going, well, don't know what happens next. Now marketing, and, you know, now marketing can just look because the leads need to be uploaded into CRM de-duped that you know with the proper lead source attached and then and then assigned to marketing or or business development or, or sales development like martin was saying and then everybody gets to see what happens so so if the, you know there's we are really moving towards collaboration the second thing is that is that the, it's the annual planning you know if um it, to, it used to be that marketing would go out and put together some plan over here and then sales would go over here and put together some plan over there. But now actually marketing and, and sales are sitting down and saying, okay, last year we did $6 million. This year we, we want to do $7 million. Where's that coming from? What are we getting from our existing book of business? What can we get from new customers? How many revite customers can we revitalize? What kind of revenue can we get from new markets or new products? Okay, team, everybody hands in, let's go. And that's kind of what's changed. Okay? Okay, this is excellent. So, uh, Darren, I'd love to get your thought on kind of that, that uh, balancing act uh, between, you know, lead volume and lead quality. So, at the end of the day, it, it really is a balancing act. You know, it, it used to be back, you know, when I started in my career in the mid nineties and, you know, obviously earlier beyond that, you know, uh, for so long, for so many companies I would meet, the salespeople were effectively responsible for a hundred percent of their own lead generation. Nobody was giving them nothing. Maybe there was some, maybe there were some advertisements and there would be some circling, some bingo cards at the back of the magazine you know, maybe there was a, a trade show every so often and they would just disperse the leads, but 90, 10, the, the owner of the company, their philosophy was you're in sales, you figure it out. And then we've had this massive swing where when I meet people that are probably, you know, Vicky's age, if, I, if that picture is, 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 is up to date, um, you know, and, 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 their, and their attitude has shifted where they say, Marketing, your job is to give me all of my leads. I'm just going to sit here and you're, and you're going to give me all my leads. So at the end of the day, mar yes, marketing, your job is to generate high quality leads, not a high volume of leads, high quality leads. What's the acceptable ratio? You know, it really, really depends on, on your product because if you're selling a commodity, then your market is broader. If you're selling something niche, then your market is more niche. But uh, you know, it, 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 you know, do I want to have 10 conversations to find out that two people are in my market and the other eight just threw their name into my trade show lead list because I was offering a free, I was offering, you know, a free iPad if you put your name in a bingo cup? 
you know? So absolutely it needs to be at a high ratio. But I will tell you, salespeople need to, need to stop, forget, need to be reminded that their job is still to also pick up a shovel and dig and to do their own lead generation. Because now everybody has empathy for each other. Everybody, it's a team approach. Why should salespeople do that? Because at the end of the day, they are responsible for a result. So if they wanna have control, if they wanna have security, if they don't wanna rely on marketing you know, exclusively and also realizing that in marketing, sometimes all the activities happen seasonally. You might go to five trade shows in a, you know, in a, in a short period of time and get all your leads and then nothing for, 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 for six months. So right. I, I, do believe, I do believe that generating leads is totally collaborative. I think you can all agree on the number of leads that we need on a monthly basis. And I think that way, marketing and sales are actually accountable together when we agree on how many leads we need. Fantastic, Darren. Thank you so much. Darcy and Darren, great perspectives. Really appreciate you sharing. Um, so let's, uh, again, let's kind of come back to, come to uh, uh, everyone here um, that's, that's joined us. Um, would love, I'll, I'll throw out a few questions that live just to kind of get the conversation started. And again, let's use the chat to, to really um, share perspectives and thoughts on this. In your organization, how do you balance the need to create MQLs um, but also ensure those leads are of high quality. And I do feel like this is actually a, a tougher question than it appears because in a lot of our, our marketing organizations, a number of MQLs is actually a metric that's measured and that you're always trying to increase. And measuring, measuring lead quality is usually not necessarily, you know, there's no explicit um, measure against that. So again, Sam DePonder would love to get your thoughts uh, in the chat. Let's uh, get another one here as well. What would, and I, I feel like this is, the, this is the corollary of the previous question. What would happen in your organization if you cut the lead volume in half? Again, if we really wanna focus on quality, then let's kind of stand behind that and let's cut the lead volume so we can really only send the best ones over to sales. So again, a little, maybe a little bit of, this is a bit of a, maybe a little bit of a controversial question, but I think it's maybe a good one to start the thinking around what's what really uh, what are the implications of this conversation? So um, again, use the chat, um, and we'll look to bring forward some of the some of the perspectives and the questions as we move forward. So I think uh, let's um, while we're excuse me while we're um, waiting for everyone to uh, share their thoughts and perspectives. Um, we'll start with a few questions that were shared in the pre-forum hub. So again, as we mentioned, the, the, the live forum starts before we get together. So then there were a number of really good questions that were posed. So let's, uh, let's start with one um, around short-term versus long-term mindset. So Tracy asked, you know, sales has a short-term mindset because their compensation is directly linked to how many sales they can make today. Very true. On the other hand, marketing has a long-term mindset because they're focused on driving sales by building a brand. So the question, um, as Tracy asks, and we'll start with Darcy and then Darren, how can you drive alignment with these two, between these two departments when they have completely different priorities and timelines in achieving goals? So again, really good question from Tracy here. Um, yeah, I'd love it. Darcy, you wanna, you, wanna, you wanna get us started here? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a great question. And I think it's something that everybody uh, suffers at some point or another, or probably consistently. But I think there, there needs to be an understanding of the role that marketing and sales will play. Um, and, I, and I kind of repeat this. I think the executive sponsorship of that agreement and the understanding is really critical to ensure that the organization gets behind it. If there isn't that kind of leadership level agreement, um, it's going to be really hard for people that are kind of in the trenches working the day to day to to you know, find symmetry and balance in what they're doing. Um, I think there needs to be a really honest conversation about strategic priorities. And that would include current data quality, CRM hygiene, the state of the market and the competitive mix. You know, what are you up against in the market? And then ultimately the level of investment being made to drive the business. So if you have significant growth expectations and you're investing in more of a, a maintenance level, um, I think you just have to be really honest about that and, and really look at what, what is possible. 
Um, once the role of marketing is defined, I think it's important to ensure the goals are relevant to the time frame. So when you're looking at volume of leads into the funnel or conversion rates, you know, you need to look at the appropriate timeline to measure performance based on the sales cycle. So you don't want to look three months into a 12 month sales cycle and say, well, our volume of leads is not strong. That, you know, there's, there's a level of driving awareness before you're hitting actual lead conversion. Um, and as a standard practice, I think it's always beneficial to highlight potential risks within a plan if there are competing priorities, which I think there always will be. So you may have marketing tasked with driving a certain number of BAMP qualified net new customer leads, but a portion of the sales team is tasked with increasing breadth of portfolio within their existing customer accounts, right? Um, but then they feel marketing should be supporting that. I think that that's, again, another area that leadership really needs to agree on the role marketing will play to ensure that the most critical business goals have the right support and that the expectations are clear for both sales and marketing. So there's not that um, conflict happening on the day to day. Cool. No, thank you for the perspective. Darren, what's your take? Um, how do you balance these like fundamentally different priorities, right? Short term versus long term so quota versus brand. So just adding a couple of little tidbits to what Darcy shared. So first of all, marketing has two jobs. One is the softer side. I suppose three jobs. One is giving sales, uh, the salespeople tools that they use when they sell. It could be decks, it could be marketing material. It could, you know, obviously, a, you know, website, things like that. Um, two is the branding, the community involvement, public relations, all that kind of stuff. And three is good, good old fashioned lead gen. So I'm a really, you know, I'm a really brick and mortars kind of person. So for me, it's pretty simple. You know, how do you drive alignment when, when, when we say that there's competing priorities? Well, it's simple. If we got together, like I said before, and said, you know, last year we did 6 million. What do we want to do as a team, guys? We want to do 7.5 million. Okay. Let's look at our existing book of business and see what that, what we can expect from them. Then let's reverse engineer based on close ratios, based on average sales sizes, um, based on sales cycle length to figure out how many leads we actually need. And then when we need them based on the sales cycle. And so it's very possible, for example, in Alex's company that, that, that in order for, for the sales team to hit their goals in Q3, leads need, those leads need to come in in Q1 because of the sales cycle. So it, it's actually pretty easy now to, to align everybody's priorities because we agree that 7.2 million is the goal. We agree that the average sale is 50,000. We agree that our existing client base will probably get us to five and a half million. We agree that we therefore need to find another, oh crap, I now need to do math. I think that's 1.8 million. You know, we agree that the close ratio is 33%, you know, and so we're, we're, we're aligned, you know, again, all hands in break. Cool. Cool. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So let's keep this moving. Uh, time is flying. And I really, again, I want to make sure we're covering a broad uh, array of perspectives. Um, oh, let me just see here. So yeah. Um, how can you change the sales mindset to understand the importance of marketing's goal of building a strong brand? And I think this is actually really interesting because I think this very question I can see from, I can see, you know, it comes from a marketer because it's like, it's, it's looking at this perspective of how do I change their mindset um, or their understanding of their appreciation for what marketing is really here to do. Um, Darcy, I'd love to get your take on this as a fellow marketer. Yeah, it is. It, it is an interesting question. I, and I personally experienced a shift, I think, in this over the years of my over the course of my career. Um, and I think it's worth noting, too, that everyone in the organization is involved in sales in some capacity. Right. Anyone that touches a process that impacts a customer plays a role in that customer life cycle and could potentially impact um, Sales. So I think this doesn't even just relate to sales um, understanding. It could be finance and legal, and and you know we, we battle that every day and, and getting approvals and things like that. Um, I think it's important to understand that the whole organization really impacts uh, the sales motion. But when you consider the customer experiences and the journeys they take today, and the exponential opportunities they have to get educated before they even engage with sales, 
I think it's critical to really understand how important a positive brand recognition is for potential customers, existing customers, you know, anything from industry influencers and analysts to buying groups and technology partners, um, channel partners. Without that focus on developing brand awareness and recognition, I think it all comes down to the, the understanding that every sales engagement would be like a cold call and nobody in sales wants to be doing cold calls all the time. Um, and, and to stress the importance of that role that marketing plays, I think it's ideal for marketing to be able to share any relevant data that they can to validate the impact that they're having, um, whether it be conversion rates through the funnel, time to revenue, you know, closed one business, average deal size, um, brand affinity, you know, that's something that, that could certainly help to, to bring some visibility to the organization and the impact that that has. Any, any metric, really, that, that sales, uh, that would be important to sales, I think that just as a proof point over time to start showcasing uh, the impact that marketing's playing um, to tell that story. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Makes sense. Um, cool. Let's move to the next one. Um, actually, you know what? Let me just jump in. I noticed that we have a, we did have a question uh, that Angela posed in the Preform Hub, and I believe Angela is actually here with us today. So would love to see uh, Angela, if you'd like to uh, come on the mic and uh, ask a question, maybe share a little bit of perspective on it. I see. Yes, I am here. So um, Angela Cope, Director of Demand Generation at Soft Choice, and uh, it's a very complex space because we're not just selling sort of one key book of services. We are selling other technology um, services from our partners, Microsoft, Azure, the list goes on. Um, and then we also have our own soft choice services. The company looks to move into more of a solutions-based consulting uh, organization, which is a challenge in itself due to 30 years of selling tech. So for us, it's around looking at all these varying leads and understanding the um, ways to present simplified information to sales around the types of leads that we have. I think one of the things we see here with marketing and my BDR team, is not all leads are equal. So what are the recommendations from the group on um, coming forward to sales? And I think understanding on both ends of the marketing teams and the sales team, you know, not overcomplicating each stage of the funnel to mark uh, to sales, but rather understanding where they focus. Okay. Awesome. Great. Pick me, pick me. <laughs> Darren, uh, please, please. So, your so, so Angela, so, you know, the irony of the conversation is that my first business back when I started in the mid nineties was a lead gen company. So what I found out very quickly is I, I, when I, I remember calling one of my clients, it was my first client ever, they, a company called Omron Electronics. And they were generating thousands of leads and I, un, unbeknownst to me, and I called the head of marketing, Keith Edwards, and I said, hi, my name is Darren Robbie. I help companies generate more leads. And he said to me, more leads? The last thing I need is more leads. I don't even know what happens with the leads we got. So I said, aha, okay, there's something here why don't you pass me all of your leads instead of generating them and I'll qualify them and I will nurture them and then we will pass you the ones that are ready. So that's effectively how my lead generation business turned into a lead management, you know, outsourced lead management business very quickly. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because the first thing that we figured out very quickly is if we didn't all agree on the definitions of what an unqualified lead was, what a disqualified lead was, what, an, what a qualified lead was, what a future lead was, what an active lead was. If we didn't agree on those definitions, we were dead, on, dead in the water. And, and even more so for me, because I was a third party. So it was easy for them to just fire me, right? Whereas in the case of employees, it's not as easy. The impact is the same, but obviously my risk was very high. So I figured out within 10 minutes, hold on. I'm, you know, people are ordering things from me, but until I agree, if you just say to me, get me some cheese, if I don't specify how much cheese, what kind of cheese, and what kind of cheese, the odds of me being successful are almost zero. So the answer, so so the answer is really simple. Just agree on the just agree on the definitions. 
Just, you know, what does unqualified need? What does disqualified need? What does qualified need? I guarantee you, Angela, you ask a sales team, define a qualified lead. And they're going to tell you somebody ready to buy tomorrow. And then I go to marketing and say, please define what a qualified lead is. And they're going to say somebody that has the capacity to buy something that we sell at some point. I love that. Darren, this is so See how far that is? So when you say, did I give you qualified leads? They're going to say no. And then you're going to say, but what do you mean? I gave you qualified leads according to my definition. Well, uh aha. Yes, you nailed it. I I love that. This is exactly kind of what we find time and time again. And where it's curled just to get started right there. Darcy, I don't want to, you know, I want to make sure I, I... before I, 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 I feel like I, I, I bloom too much here around Darren's uh, perspective, I'd love to get yours as well. Oh, I think it's spot on. I, I think that's a, a, a critical piece. I mean, it's, it is speaking the same language and, and making sure that there's an understanding of the definitions and the, you know, what that means through the process and, you know, agreement within the SLAs and those, and those qualification processes to define what are we considering to be qualified and what does an ideal lead look like? I mean, I think it's all in the conversation, but I, I think that's that answer is spot on. I would totally agree. Excellent. You know, Excellent. And, and, then, and then my last point is for you, Angela, is that, so if you agree on, if you agree on the definition of what kind of leads everybody wants, and then actually the stages after that, meaning what happens after they actually follow up and you reverse engineer to figure out how many leads you actually need based on what you expect of your existing customers to deliver versus how much new business you need, the close ratios, the sales cycles, the average, uh, the average relationship size annualized or one time, depending on what the business is. If you do that, like, where is there to hide? There's like nowhere to hide, right? Everything's black and white. Yeah. And Darren, to, to that point that you're making too, I think that's a good Somebody asked another question on um, CRM hygiene. I think that's really important too, as part of that conversation, because I think that as a marketer, that's often what we see is, is sales doesn't always maintain the hygiene of the information once the leads are passed over. So you have leads getting converted to, you know, using another process and getting converted to another opportunity and all of the information on that lead gets lost or the data hygiene isn't maintained. So I think that's really important to understand and make sure the integrity of all that information that, that you're you're talking about is maintained. Right. Almost yeah. none of this entire discussion works if your team is not sharing a CRM platform properly. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Which again is 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 a common problem. Okay, wonderful. So really good uh, questions. I'd love to Kind of remind everyone, uh, use the chat, uh, provide your uh, your thoughts and feedback. Angela, thanks so much for coming on and sharing that. Um, I noticed um, maybe now is a good time. Oops, sorry. Now maybe it's a good time to uh, Leah to see uh, what's been coming in through chat and what your uh, if there's anyone that you think um, we could uh, we could we could involve in the conversation. Sure, let me just unmute myself. Um, I was direct messaging with Martin behind the scenes uh, just because I thought his comment around moving, actually moving away from MQL to SQL was interesting. So I asked if he'd be comfortable to just come on and share that perspective. And then I also saw Chris had had uh, a question. So maybe we could have Martin come on and then uh, and then Chris come on. And then we'll be just about out of time, I think. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Leah. Uh, nice to talk to everyone. Um, so my comment was, I'm, I'm finding myself lately, I want to say last year or so, really working closely with the sales leaders to, to align on the targeting. And I think the best way to do that is by not uh, giving the marketing team just the MQL target. Um, that is an easy target to manipulate. I well, use the words in, in frames. What I mean by that, you can go out the marketplace, you can buy leads. And, and those are typically pretty bad leads that don't convert. So I think I really want to focus on the conversion model, making sure that that works. So, and, and basically mean I'm out of those X number of leads that you provide, how many of them are actually accepted by the sales organization? in some capacity and actually will convert into an opportunity for the sales team. And that's what that will help you by default focus on the leads that have high quality um, and that and the sales team will start loving you because then they're dealing with less crap uh, and ultimately with uh, opportunities that have higher um, opportunity to convert. So I typically don't like to put MQLs as a result as a, as a target, but rather 
that conversion number um, and maybe CAC or you know um, the cost per acquisition. So and which which really is tied to the sale rather than the the cost per lead. Uh, anyway, that's sort of my thoughts there. I love the perspective, Martin. Could yeah, could not agree more. Again, I, I see you've been wrestling with this challenge for some time. You're finding some really kind of a good creative solutions. I could not agree more. Conversion ratios for me are critical. Uh, they, especially once you set up the stages of the funnel. So no, fantastic perspective. Thanks so much for sharing. Now, uh, Leah mentioned um, Chris, I believe, might have a perspective as well. Uh, hi, Z. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to quickly jump in. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for hosting this and, uh, and Darcy and Darren for your perspectives. Um, I, uh, Darren, I just, I thought it was really interesting what you mentioned about the, the CRM, um, improving basically the visibility or, uh, for, for lead follow-up between marketing and sales. And I, I really just wanted to follow up with that. I, I work very closely with the uh, marketing automation platforms and CRM. And uh, I guess I just wanted to know if, if uh, your perspective on, you know, other roles that, that, you know, marketing technology plays in supporting marketing and sales alignment. You know, it, uh, the thing that comes to mind is when we're qualifying lead, leads, obviously uh, most of these platforms allow you to create new custom, um, you know, custom, custom fields where you can track, uh, you know, certain aspects of a lead coming through. I was just wanting to know, you know, what what, uh, what your perspective is on on, you know, how yeah, what marketing technology can play in terms of you know managing that relationship between marketing and sales and just making sure they're in alignment. Awesome, Chris. Yeah, Chris. so <clears throat> so you know, when I first bumped into CRM in '97, it was ACT, you know, um, Tracker Maximizer, and then Salesforce.com came around in 1999, 2000. And here we are today and CRM is now, we used to be a standalone, but now it's actually the middle and all of these other technologies are connecting to it. So what are those other technologies? Well, you know, uh, things like Zoom Info, where you, where you can give the power to your sales team to be able to sort what is what is what I would say to be some of the highest quali qualified database access leads you could, you could come by. And that can go nicely into CRM. Another one would be your contact us form on your website. That should be able to jump right into CRM as well. And then trigger based on certain parameters, geography, industry, whatever, you know, whether they're a prospect or not, who it goes to. So that's another one. Another one is the connection between tools like Slack and LinkedIn Navigator and LinkedIn that really, really helped to bring you know, all that collaboration, because we know that we're not only talking on phones and emails anymore. We're talking on phones and emails and Slack and texting and LinkedIn and, 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 and. So you definitely want to add, um, you definitely want to add those kinds of um, um, uh, technology platforms uh, to them as well. And the last thing is, you know, amazingly enough, as, as silly as it sounds, um, in order for CRM to succeed, it's got to connect to this. It has to connect to this. Those are pictures of my partner and children. Um, you know, it's, it's got to, you, your emails have to be able to sync. Your calendar needs to be able to sync. You need to be able to access all your information, whether you're standing in a booth at a trade show or whether you're sitting in the parking lot about to, to go into or, about, or just finish leaving a deal. Excellent. Excellent, Darren. No, this is a really good perspective. I just want to be, this is, I feel like this is, I feel like it's a bit of a challenge. We're just getting warmed up. There's some really good questions and discussions, uh, discussion that's getting started. However, we are kind of starting to hit the uh, getting close to, um, close, getting close to the end. Um, I know we originally were hoping to kind of finish off a little bit early, but I feel like the discussion is just getting started. We had one more, I'd love to call on one more person. There was a great question around um, I believe from Carol around leadership involvement. So I would love to hear from Carol and get her, get uh, Darcy and Darren to provide their perspectives. And then we're going to look to uh, move on to tools um, and takeaways and look to kind of wrap things up. Again, want to be cognizant of everyone's time, but at the same time, I feel, I feel like we're just getting really started here. So Carol, are you comfortable um, to come on, on mic and share? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, so my question was really around I mean, I think in theory, all this is really great. And I have seen um, in my experience, some really great um, team efforts on the ground between marketing and sales. But I feel like oftentimes a big roadblock is when the alignment doesn't exist 
above them at the VP level, at the CMO level, um, you know, sales leadership don't see value in the things that you're trying to put through. So what happens, at least on the marketing side, is you're like, I want to be able to give these guys less leads, but good quality leads. I want to be able to help this team. And the sales team doesn't want to make time for you because their leadership isn't making time for you and doesn't see the value. So I'd love just to understand, like, are there any tips for how to get leadership on board, especially if it's a big change, like, you know, your CMO is now reporting instead of thousands of MQLs, they're reporting, you know, hundreds of MQLs or hundreds of, of qualified leads. And that's a huge change um, that they now have to manage at the, the top level. So any tips for how to get leadership on board, especially on the sales side of the fence? So I would say a couple of things. First of all, I'm seeing more and more and more, even in bigger organizations where the VP of sales and the VP of marketing is the same person. Yeah. You know, which, which I actually, you know, one could argue, well, they're two different things. How do you be able to do both? But then the other one can argue based on the past 45 minute discussion that, well, they're not two, you know, one is, you know, one is the ingredient, one is the food and the other one is the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, they absolutely should be collaborated. So if you have a situation, if you have at the very, very top, a person that is, that is running both, even if you have a, you know, VP of sales and marketing here, you have an executive VP of the front of the house, which is sales and marketing. Um, I think that that'll help. The second thing is if I don't know too many leaders that don't like metrics. And so if you are just a metric driven company and you are screaming the metrics, you know, I, you know, you walk into a car dealership in the 1990s into the sales war room and they would have like a whiteboard listing all the sales reps and all the deals and all the, and it's pumping up and blah, 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 blah. Why? Because you can see it. So if you make, if you make metrics, you know, something that you talk about and you say every month we're sitting down, we're looking at, you know, whatever our definitions are, unqualified, marketing qualified, sales qualified. We're talking how many of them have gone to quotes, how many of them have gone to sales. We're talking about what am I doing about it? What am I not doing about it? Okay. How can, how can they not get along? Mm -hmm. No, this is this is great, Darren. So I was just in the interest of time. I, I'd love to get Darcy to chime in here because I also feel like there is an element here, again, like especially the way Carol phrased it around, you know, what you know, how do you how do you explain to your leadership, which then has to justify to the executive, why the MQL targets are off? And there's definitely some change management there, and that can be challenging, kind of trying to manage upwards. What's what's your thought on that, Darcy? Yeah, Carol, it's a great question, and and it's something I think, um, you know, again, the leadership buy-in on. The, the whole process and the role that marketing and, and sales are playing in that revenue attainment is absolutely critical. I think this also leads into, you know, Darren was alluding to it on the metrics. That is such an important component and it reverts back to the last question around the technology, you know, looking at how can marketing actually showcase, and I think there's strong alignment between marketing and sales ops as well. How can marketing showcase the results in a way that's meaningful for sales so that you can have a an educated discussion about what's working and what's not working um, versus, you know, I don't, I don't really, even in a marketing role, I don't get overly excited about the kind of vanity metrics, the clicks and, and that type of thing, because ultimately it all has to come back to the, the revenue attainment. So the funnel metrics, the conversion rates, you know, how we're achieving year over year or against our goals or against industry benchmarks, whatever it may be. I think, I think that part of it, making sure that you're focused on um, being able to showcase and bring bring to light the actual results versus uh, kind of, you know, I think a lot of times marketing gets wrapped up in the vanity metrics and things like that, that to sales, it doesn't really mean much. So really getting into the, the detail of what's important to sales um, and, and making sure that's the information you're looking at to gauge, um, you know, quality and, and performance. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Darcy. Carol, thanks so much for coming on. I really have to say, I, I feel, it feels like we're just getting started, but uh, but again, we got we have to move on here. Um, many thanks to I, I want to thank certainly um, you know Tracy for and Angela and Emily for adding the questions into the preform hub. Angela, thanks so much for coming on. Martin, thanks for adding your perspective. Chris and K Carol, great uh, great to hit, get your questions as well. I know there's a number of other questions that are starting to come in. Uh, I see one from Anne. So I think what I want to say, like, if there's any questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, we'll add them into the, uh, the LinkedIn group, and then we'll actually look to continue the conversation afterwards. All right. So just in the interest of time here, 
I think again, like uh, as as we look to um, to really kind of, I, I feel like the, the big uh, there's lots of good conversation, and obviously, like what what can we take away from this, right? What's the um, how do we action this? So I think there's different there's certainly ways of improving sales and marketing alignment. Uh, what resources that you would recommend? Again, Martin, really appreciate what you shared. I think that that's very relevant for everyone here to kind of consider and think about. Uh, I would actually say, you know, for anyone else, feel free to share any tools, resources, approaches that you've taken in your organization to try to start these conversations. Uh, while we wait for that input, um, we've actually put together uh, a few resources from our own experience of, um, of what we have found works to try to start the conversation if you're not already having the conversation. It certainly seems like some folks already are, but I, I think these, um, these resources can be very useful uh, to, to really get the, get the conversation going. So one of the things we've seen is the, the, the discussion needs to occur, but where do you start? How do you start? So really we've developed some marketing talking points and a supporting agenda to really kind of get that conversation started. So Emily will share uh, the links to these open and editable documents in the chat. So again, we really want to make sure anyone can just download it and slap your, slap your company's logo in there and use this. Obviously edit as you see fit. It may, some of this may or may not be applicable in your organization. Um, try, try them out, uh, see if they're, they're helpful and share your stories in the LinkedIn community. Um, and let us know what worked and what didn't. So um, really, again, I think the whole point here is that, and I think it's kind of come up a number of times, it's not just about technology and the frameworks, it really, it's about the conversation, the collaboration. Um, Leah, Let's. I think. I think. I mean. I. I. I there might be more. More questions or perspectives that are coming in, but I, I. Just in terms of time, I think we'll probably need to kind of move to close here. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. Let's just to to be respectful of everyone's time. I have seen a couple of things uh, come in, but I think we can all sort of review them on the chat. And I see that both Darcy and Darren have also put their emails there. So if anybody has additional questions that they want, please feel free to reach out there. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so again, just want to be really cognizant of everyone's time. Let's finish a little bit early, let everybody have a bathroom break um, um, before their next meeting. I know we're all used to, we're way too used to this back to back. So thank you all for a great session. I mean, I think really the participation, the, the good questions, I, I feel like really kind of got us going and, and enable us to take this to, to, to uh, a higher level than it would have otherwise been possible. So again, as we mentioned in the past, we'll be sharing the slide deck, the recording, as well as some of the resources that we covered in a follow-up email, um, as well as the LinkedIn group. And please, if you have time, uh, please take 30 seconds to give us feedback on how this worked. Your feet, you know, really, we're gonna be looking to run these quarterly. We'd love to take the input around what worked, what didn't, what you would like to see so we can actually look to incorporate in the next one. Darcy, Darren, I can't thank you enough. Really, again, I think the, the, the experience and the perspectives really kind of come through in terms of you guys have kind of been there, done that, uh, have uh, the scars to show it. Really appreciate you guys jumping on and spending the time with us today. Thank you all. Thanks for the participation too. Great to see everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, great. And then um, I will say the last note here again, this is we're going to run this on a quarterly basis. So we were really tackling the, the channel communications between marketing and sales. Um, and the next one in May, we're going to look to folks in marketing and IT. So certainly, I think most marketers have acquired uh, 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 stacks of technology over the last 10, 10 something years. And really, the big question is that how do you actually realize our on that? How do you drive revenue? with that technology. Again, we're going to look to tackle that one next time. So please join us if you have the time. But as we wrap up, again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we'd love to uh, have you continue the, to engage in the LinkedIn group afterwards. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.